Joe Martin and Dave Donaldson here kicking off this episode of Entrepreneurial Impact. What I'm really excited about today, especially in our industry within real estate, which I'd rather just consider home service, right, to our consumers. Like it sounds like real estate, well, real estate's a bunch of different things, but at the end of the day, we're trying to deliver the power of home to individuals. And you know what I actually wanted to do when I was talking to Dave about what the heck do we want to cover this week? Um, the hot topic of the moment, I think, within um, the power of home, because I think everyone says real estate. So let me do some pattern interrupts on people's uh, preconceived notions of real estate that we're just overpaid uh, uh, used car salesmen, um, which is actually fascinating because I think some of this actually came from that perception by the, the, by the general public. Um, and the hot topic has been, oh, my Lord. Everything's changing. The world's coming down. Chicken little. The sky is falling around August 17th, right? So why not jump on the bandwagon and keep talking about August 17th? You know what really irritates me about the whole conversation around August 17th? What's that? We've, well, we've known about it. Yeah. We knew it was coming. And August 17th came and it went. And still people have to move, invest in real estate, live in real estate, everything around the home, right? Because people have to live somewhere because it's shelter. And the only thing that happened was clarity around buyer representation and removing cooperative compensation inside of the MLS. Now there's a bunch of other things, but I'm just, I'm just gonna make it very simple. Like that's what happened. Um, and what I think is interesting, I, I think when we dive into specifics of change, well, let's look at the psychology of humans. Humans hate change, right? Could be the best change in the world. Ah, I got to change. I hate it. This thing doesn't work. No, nah, it works. It just does it differently. You know, kind of like our constant battle throughout this podcast of Apple versus Android. <laughs> it does the thing. It sends an email. It sends a text message or receives a text message. It just happens to be in a blue bubble or green bubble. And sometimes you jack up, you know, the, the group text because you're on a green bubble. Um, and then yeah, you got to go on to WhatsApp clear. and download uh, that Apple's thing. now has hired Samsung to build their camera infrastructure. I'm just saying. I, you know, I, I, you know, maybe, maybe you guys will integrate onto the, the <laughs> iMessage platform. So it's actually, you know, it, it, it doesn't mess up my group chat. But what I mean by this is that like psychology, people just hate change. So it doesn't matter what the change is. Here's the piece though. Um, change is welcome when we embrace it, go through the journey of why it's important and all that. What change sucks when it's forced upon us. So I think we, you've heard these stories of Blockbuster and Netflix and Uber and taxi cabs. And my biggest part is like, I'm looking back on it and history repeats itself just to different players. We are sitting through a change in our industry that's been forced upon us because instead of moving to where the consumer wants to be or what's best for the consumer, because without the consumer, none of the transaction, all the other services happen. It took the DOJ to step in with a bunch of lawyers and plaintiffs out of Missouri to say, we don't like what you're doing. We think it's discombobulated and jacked up and you're artificially inflating the price. So we're going to make changes to your industry, even though we have no idea what's going on with it. Right. Like one funny joke is, you know, it'd be hilarious right now. So if the, the current ruling is you can't open you now in Virginia, it's been like this for a long time with signed buyer reps. I get it. But like, can you imagine the, the DOJ? Someone that sat on DOJ is like, okay, every time I have to go see a house, I've got to sign a buyer rep agreement. I mean, like, got to follow the law. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you don't do that. But, like, let's be clear. Like, I got to sit down and even if it's a one-day representation or something like that, so I got to sign this. That's like, hey, you come into Nordstrom's to buy a shirt. Like, you're not going to buy anything. You're trying to search it. Sign this disclosure about being a buyer representation agreement so you can come into Nordstrom, right? So, like... I'm being a little bit her like a heretic here and I'm telling everybody, follow the rules. The rules are this, but like you really think like potential cus like currently customers, not clients are going to be like, I've got to sign a doc to see this thing. Like the, the whole idea around open houses is like, oh, I can't wait to go in this thing. I can't wait to sh you know, window shop. So we've put that on there. Think about a DOJ member being like, oh yeah, this makes a whole lot of sense. Right. Like, you can go in an open house without a representation agreement, but you can't go in with your, you know, they're splitting hairs to a degree. Right. Um, but but it it stems from the complaint. Right. Correct. Saying, hey, I don't understand 
what value is being provided for me. I don't understand around what I'm paying and how I was paying, who's provided these types of things. Uh, I do put a lot of the blame to a degree on the on us as agents. We, 100%. we did not do our jobs well, even in the states where we had buyer representation. My, my biggest takeaway was I was shocked at how many locales did not have representation agreements. I mean, I had them in Arizona and I had them here in Virginia, so they've always been part of my business. So I knew how to utilize them. But I think we under, we watered them down. We were scared of the conversations of providing value and defining what my, you know, what my value was if I was working with a buyer. People find it easier on the listing side, I think. Um, but we've allowed people to come into our field, devalue that because there is very good money in it. And we have nobody to look to blame but ourselves to a degree. Now, in order to rectify that, we have to take ownership of that and we have to do things properly. And it's easy to say, well, it's change but not change, but it's a change in mindset for a lot of people to look at how that they, even the more successful agents I've had, I've had a lot, a lot of conversations with them around their, their representation conversations. And they would always go to the path of least resistance around, well, the, the, you're compensating me theoretically, but it's going to come from the other side. That's the barrier. It was always easier to say it's coming from somebody else. You don't have to worry about it because we had the openness of sharing conversations. So with that coming in or being removed from the MLS, and we could talk about what that's actually going to look like a year from now, because there's going to be the other side of complaints that are going to come about true you know, openness of competition and sharing and that capacity and are people actually being harmed, whether it's sellers or buyers, by lack of true clarity around compensation. Um, I think the agents themselves just really have to look at and define better. Joe, if I'm going to represent you, this is what I do. And the funniest thing about that, the, the smallest level of that is actually helping you find a property online because you, you can do a lot of that yourself by using the tools that I service or provide you. But it's everything above and beyond that, right? I know my inventory. I know my market. Right. What percentage of the houses on the market versus how many percentages are on the market that that are available but aren't publicly available? Right. And what does that mean? I know people that would potentially sell but aren't actively selling. Right. I know investors that are buying property that could there could be wholesale opportunities or investor opportunities. There's the value conversation above and beyond that of of knowing that. As a professional real estate agent, I can't necessarily summarize in bullet points my value, but I can share through experience, right? And sheer number of conversations and communication around that, that defines the real benefit of what I'm going to do for you in the long haul. It goes back to, you know, what's funny about all this, right? Is that if you ask, well, it was two, two funny things that I saw, right? So if you really want to see a comical thing, follow a bunch of real estate agent, like Facebook pages or Facebook groups. It is pure comedy to see the different like comments and back and forth that go into those things. And I watch those things mainly because I'm, you know, it's at night at eight o'clock at night and I'm like, yeah, I kind of want to see some humor. Those groups, epic humor. If you think the HOA groups have certain communities where you see people going back and forth about dog droppings and picking up dog poop and different things about lawns, like it's, it's comical, right? That's pretty funny to me. I watch those things and read those things. And I read a lot of real estate agent groups because it's, it's fascinating to see what people go off on. Um, but the one that's interesting is like the fact that people don't understand, like even agents, right. Can't understand how compensation was actually being paid at times. Right. And there's so many different interpretations, which is fascinating to me also. So do we even know our own stuff? So this is where I'm getting at from a, what happened to us was due to us not innovating on our own, doing what's best for the customer that then becomes our client. And then also thinking about what's the futuristic needs of our entire industry so that we're actually providing value to the customer. This is actually where I think it drives home is that when we are constantly thinking about what's best for me, what's best for me, what's best for my business and avoiding or dis like dismissing what's best for our customer, we're actually missing the fact that the customer pays for everything. So I was on a bunch of calls with a lot of real estate agents around, how is this hurting my business? How is this going to hurt my GCI, my income? What was me? Instead of saying, well, yeah, we kind of did it to ourselves. And instead of saying, well, here's an opportunity now to learn from the fact that the DOJ stepped in and said, you aren't providing value to your customers. Right, wrong, or indifferent, they just came in and did it. 
which tells me, why don't you learn from the bump in the road and not hit it again and say, got it. They're coming. They want to do this when the DOJ puts DOJ doesn't lose. And in my opinion, the DOJ is looking to have sellers pay listing agents and buyers pay buyer agents for representation. Now, that doesn't mean inside of your offer, you can't put something into your offer about whatever you want that to be, because that's open negotiations, right? And they can choose to accept it. They can choose not to, whatever that may be. But your agreement is with the person that's representing you, right? And that's what they want to do. Whether that's right, whether that's wrong, whether it hurts representation for people that are first-time home buyers or have a different financial class, like I see challenges in that. But let's bring it up one tick instead of like, woe was me and argument about how this should go or that form should go. It comes down to three things and you're bringing up value, Dave, is that this is what customers want. This is what the general public that are not real estate agents want in buyer representation. They want a professional advisor that knows their stuff. So everything that you just brought up is your value proposition of local knowledge, inventory, price points, days on market, uh, what, what general offers look like, what things go for, what things you can ask for in negotiations, what things you don't really want to ask for. If you want to get the roof replaced, don't worry about the door locks. Like these are common things you want to go through, right? If you have a water heater issue, great. We're going to deal with the water heater issue and we're not going to worry about the fact that the door is a little slanted. I've got a screwdriver, right? So professional ad advisory services, right? Number two is risk mitigation, because I don't want to make a mess up on this because I only buy three to five houses a year. You sell X amount of houses a year. And the final thing is capital preservation. So capital preservation could be how much do I come out of pocket to buy the thing? How much do I not come out of pocket? Do I want to buy rates down? Do I not want to buy rates down? Do I want to increase? Do I need to do a renovation inside the listing to get a higher price point? So when you think about all those three things, you're being hired. If you want to call yourself a real estate advisor, you need to then treat that as such as if I'm an attorney, a CPA, or financial planner, right? Which means I need to advise you. I need to make sure that you're not going to make take any undue risks and that I'm helping your capital being deployed or preserved. That's what consumers want. So when you think about your value proposition, the challenge that you actually brought up about buyer rep is that on the listing side, there's an asset, which means those people, those clients bought the house. They know a little bit more than first time buyers, right? So they're gonna sit there and say, I know this, I know that. I looked at my, everybody's nosy in their neighborhood. So they know what this got sold for and that got sold for. They have more information, which means you have to be more of a professional to get a listing. They do a little bit more research. Whereas buyers historically have basically it's speed to lead. So the first person that responds to my inquiry historically has gotten my representation as a buyer. And because compensation was always as an incentive on the other side by the seller, there wasn't a driving need to have a conversation about what is Dave's value to me as the buyer in order to pay and be commiserated for the efforts that he had, right? And that's what I think is actually the, the loss in the sauce here is we have to go back to what does the consumer need? Forget what we want. Forget what I desire this and I demand that and I can't believe they did this to me and they don't know what they're talking about. Great. Bunch of complaints that you can't change. So you know what's actually really empowering and actually causes an impact for the future? Damn. Why don't I learn from all those mistakes about what I should have done on our own and what NAR should have done and what our broker should have done and what our agent should have done and what we, you know, the, the whole like selfishness and said, great. I just learned that the consumer wants a different experience, a different value in the home buying experience. If I'm a home buyer, what would be the idealistic experience and journey to go through? You know what? Here's the whole interesting thing with all of this, because when you say you're putting everybody in the same bucket and we're actually looking at a lawsuit, it's a very small bucket. Hmm. That's the pro that's the challenge with a lot of this. They're making assumptions and, and they're treating everybody the same. And it's, it, it's an incredibly unique process because everything is different. It's not a single, I'm not, I'm not buying a, a wicket. Right. Every house is different. Every locale is different. Right. Every asset is different. Every relationship is different. Suggestions of value are different. There's a skill set associated with that that is different from person to person. Um, the results aren't necessarily static to based off of the person that you present. And so that's kind of what I'm like that people have to understand. Right. It's not buying houses on Amazon. 
right? This isn't the Sears catalog from the 30s where I could order houses to come on a piece of land. They have companies that do that now. I just want to let you know that they do have, yes, I think the company is called Boxable. You can I, actually I have, buy a house and get it shipped. Small houses and all this. Like, sure. There, there's a, a niche and a percentage to everything, but then there's the law of large numbers that, hey, you know, I actually recently had a conversation with somebody that the first transaction they ever did, uh, not on purchase, but on the sale, they, they sold their own home. And this was a number of years ago, but we were recently talking around uh, this transaction and what's happening. And I said, hey, would you do that again? And he's like, his unmitigated answer was like, absolutely no bleep in way would I ever do this again without representation. Ever. And I, I and this was somebody that I, I tremendously respect. And he like somebody that's a competent individual. And he's like, I will never, ever go through that again. He's like, there was so much I took for granted that I didn't know. And here I was 12 six, 12, 18 months later, getting calls and complaints from the person that bought my house about this, that, or the other thing. And yep. there was a lot of things that he just like, yeah. And, you know, he's a business owner, so he gets it. He goes, like, he's, it was a trial and error, but I'll, I'll never do it again. So here's, here's an interesting piece about this, like, value proposition, articulation, that thing like agents historically right have spent now 60 to 100 some odd hours getting licensed and then they learn lead generation and they understand like how to use sales tactics and what used to be called scripts let's call those dialogues now um to help people you know progress a conversation here's the challenge is that we are no longer selling something because of the all the changes and awareness and all that. What we're actually selling is an experience, right? So let me give you an example of this one. Um, do you buy a drill because it's an awesome drill? Like purely the only reason you buy a drill is because it's an awesome drill. No. No. You buy a drill because you don't want to get carpal tunnel from a manual screwdriver or because it provides a hole in the drywall or in a stud to hang something. So the outcome is why you're buying the drill. So if you think about the differences, it's like, oh, I got to have a drill because I need the drill to put a screw in. Well, actually, there's a million ways to put the, the screw into the stud or the drywall, wherever it may be. There's a bunch of different ways. You just buy that particular drill because it does it the right way. Right. So I could take a hammer and put a screw into a stud. Probably not going to go out that well. But like the point being is that we're buying things for the outcome that they provide or the experience it provides. So if you think about you as an agent in representation, your buyer is is utilizing you as your because your professional advisory, because of your risk mitigation abilities and your capital preservation. Right. On, on, on the buyer's list side. Yeah, yeah. I so can... how do we start thinking through that? But going back to your point, is that like he never wanted to do it again? It's because the this is why I firmly believe that agents are always going to be necessary in the transaction is that the emotional side of the transaction, right? It's like like, like if you're in, you know, you say you're I don't know up for murder charges. I'm getting extreme <laughs> with this. You don't want to be the, your own attorney because your emotions get the best of you. So you want a third party being like, I got nothing vested in this. I got your representation because I'm getting paid by you and I want to get you off the charge. But like I can make more logical decisions from you for on your behalf because I'm not emotionally sitting through all those things that you go through. The fear of loss, the fear of overpaying, the fear of whatever. The, it's usually a loss factor. Right. So if you think about what is our what if you could put if you could be unbridled to how changes in real estate happen around mm -hmm. compensation, open houses, documentation, legal, compliance, all these changes and say, all these changes came because we need to bring transparency to the transaction because that's what D DOJ wants. And the in unintended thing is that like they think it's going to somehow lower price points. That's not going to happen because we have an inventory issue. That's at Econ 101. So now it's like, what do you control of? People feel most disenchanted and negative when they feel they have no control of their current situation. So I'd empower everybody that's listening is like, okay, that's where this is coming from. That's why it feels negative. People don't like change. Got it. Awesome. That's why I don't go from iPhone to Android, even though it's a superior product that's iPhone. Um, it's because change is not great. And the second part is like, 
So then, okay, if I'm going to be forced into change, I might as well have change done my way. So why not take control of that and say, damn, okay, my buyer rep and needs analysis is going to get better. And truthfully, anybody listening today, would you honestly be, why don't you video, video record your needs analysis or your buyer needs analysis on your meeting? Literally pull up your iPad and, and, and do it and record it and then play it back to yourself. And be like, is that legitimate? Like if I was a educated buyer, is that is that really good at conveying my value? Or even bring it to your broker manager, right? Or maybe some like unbridled, uh, you know, un unbiased somebody else and let them read it, get some feedback, right? And here's the other thing that clients are going to want now moving forward. You can't just say, I'll get you search, I'll open some doors and I'll negotiate the, the back and forth. It's like, what other services and products that are around the home? Like, what do I need to have to understand what my home's worth? How do I manage my home? Do I need a property manager or do I need preferred vendors? Do I need check-ins about different ways to, you know, best position the property? Do I need like pest control? Do I not need pest control? Do Like, what else do I need inside the home? And then start thinking about instead of, hey, Dave, it's Joe calling for your fall check-in. Did you get your, your gutters cleaned? No. Like, uh, no, the better one is, hey, Dave, um, I've got my 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 guy going out, my my preferred contractor going out for cleaning gutters this week. Um, I'm picking 15 of my clients to get their gutters cleaned. Do you want me to send them? Yeah. Absolutely. Send them right over. Right. So my point being is that, like, hey, I'm sending that out there. But like, dang, Joe's positioned himself as, like, understanding how I am as a homeowner. I don't want to call somebody. I don't want to think about it. And if he does it for me as a client retention gift and I just paid the, the gutter cleaner, I don't know, a thousand bucks for the day and he went out and did 20 homes, like, hmm, yeah, I provided an article of value that's actually important and it shows that I care about you. So my point being is like, how do you reposition what lead generation and value to your clients are for your touch campaigns while still being positioned as I'm a homeownership expert and you always need to come back to me for all your homeownership needs? Because I might not have, I might have the answer, or I might have a professional that you need to be in touch with. No, I mean, you here's my question. You, Final part, because this is like something I'm really passionate about. Like, right. this is one of those things: is stop sitting on the sidelines, stop complaining, understand what got put upon you, and then go bring real value. If I'm sitting here as your attorney, and I'm going through, or maybe it's your 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 trust attorney, right? So set up your will and testament, all that, and you go, hey, Dave or Joe, going through a divorce. Uh, who do you recommend? And I go call this person. You think you're going to check question anything else? And you're like, no, I'm calling that person, right? Here's the challenge. In our industry, once again, best for the consumer, we're taught not to make any decisions, not to give any recommendations. Oh, here's your seven people to choose from, blah, blah, blah. Oh, well, oh that one sucked. Well, you know, sorry, it was your choice, not mine. Like, the, this is the, the challenge of like our industry right now is what is the value and how do you give people true tangible products and services that once again, prove you as an advisor, risk mitigate loss to them and capitally preserve the cash that they have going into the asset. You're really straight, straight to cord there. Like, and I talk about, I've always talked about sphere-based businesses. And it, again, it's the value sphere-based business relationships are all tied together here. Right. And I think about, the recommendations we make like and there and there's seldom does the time go by where i recommend somebody that i haven't personally used right and if i have it i know that my client has or a trusted valuable resource like yourself may have if i have to fill in the gaps with somebody but like think of all the other avenues like when you are truly a viable asset in somebody's world okay i've helped people find jobs right i've helped i've helped people buy investment properties i've coached them to buy properties for where their kids would go to colleges i've helped people buy townhouse and say hey 18 years from now this is going to pay for college those conversations are different right when divorce or all the other things that can happen in life estate planning life planning when you become that viable asset where they think that you are dave is just my he's my yellow pages right dave's my guy that's what we're talking about here, right? Dave is there for me on unjudgmental, unabashed, unbiased, will give me recommendations and I can trust what he's going to say. Now, does that mean everything's perfect? No, 
but that gives you a reason to be in the world consistently and regularly. That's value. That's the, when we talk about power of home, we're that person, right? We're that key to all those things that they need to have around their home that they're going to use from one year to the next or every other year to the next, right? And build generational relationships because those kids are going to buy houses someday. They're going to have to sell and downsize someday. And as long as you're there and you have a clear mind about what your expectations are and you're doing them for the right reasons, you'll never be questioned for value again. Well, it's, it's once again, if everyone like for this episode, it was literally like, yes, these changes went on. Life goes, continues, business continues. None of you have left real estate running for the hills. But I think the takeaway here is the, what Dave just brought up is advisory services. Like my, my mom's will and testament attorney, I still use because he did a great job with it. I've got my financial planning with two different people because of personal relationships. And the point being is that if you do an amazing job for your parents, you do an amazing job for the grandparents, great job for the kids, amazing job for the aunt and uncle and the kids and all those close family, you will consistently be positioned as you need to work with Dave because this is how he positioned this asset for me. Not that he sold it in 30 days or that he got a you know multiple offer situation and got me 10% above. No one remembers that. What they remember was I had a flood and the first person I called was Dave. And within two hours, he had whatever remediation yeah. company out there, right? That in the pain points of life, you were there. It wasn't when I needed to buy or sell. It was, holy crap, the ceiling came down. Gotcha. I've got a drywall person for it. I'm bringing two fans over right now to dry it out for you from the whatever the leak was. We're going to get that dried up for you and we're going to get that taken care of. Yeah, it's or that you needed a quick paint job because your two-year-old decided to like take, I don't know, markers all over the thing with your Sharpie and you need to have it cleaned up within 24 hours. Gotcha. I got a painter for you. Like that's what they're looking for is that in my time of pain, did you show up? You couldn't be right on. It's funny. We could talk about this. You know, there's there's a tenure side of this of having been around the block a little bit, right? But like you strike a chord. I think about those floods. I had somebody that was actually under contract and closed. And then after they found out the washer was leaking down into the wall and they came in to move in moving day and the basement was soaking saturated because they were moving in like a week later. Insurance company re remediated. But I'm like, something's still not right. I brought in my own person, right, to kind of run a moisture reading on the walls. Everything was still soaked in there. Mm -hmm. Right. But we made sure it got done and I wasn't done until it was done. That's a client for life. You saved them thousands of dollars that they wouldn't have known how to na navigate otherwise. Precisely. You're an advisor. Yep. And I think that's the piece. If you take nothing away, else away from there, treat yourself as an advisor. And what do your advisors that you're trusted in and in business, one other little nugget, you should have an attorney. You should have a financial planner and a great CPA. Yep. And also, because you got to live somewhere, a great real estate advisor. There you go. Well, listen, awesome. Be an advisor, be valuable, and you'll never be wanting for work. Listen, everybody, thanks for joining us on another episode of Entrepreneurial Impact. And tune in next week. I'm Dave, and that's Joe. Have a great day. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.